Hi, I'm Aaron from Living Science Videos. It's hard to tell what most people used to think about what life was made of or how it worked. On the scale of human history, it wasn't that long ago that nobody had any idea. Were plants and animals just magically animated matter? According to the old belief in vitalism, it seems that a lot of people used to think so. Then in the year 1595, a father and son team of Hans and Zacharias Janssen were making eyeglasses in the Netherlands, and they figured out how to align and combine the lenses to look at things far away or up close. They might have invented the first telescope and the first microscope, one that could magnify up to nine times actual size. But that changed everything. These two inventions were the must-have apparatus for scientists everywhere. While the telescope could show us a better view of worlds we usually already knew about, the microscope revealed a whole other world within our world that no one knew was even there. Taking advantage of this new technology required a scientific mind. In the Age of Enlightenment, England's Robert Hooke was reported to be one of the best. He was already an accomplished scientist in many different fields, chemistry, astronomy, biology, and physics, among others, and he was an inventor and an architect and an artist. Hooke got a hold of a microscope and started looking at all sorts of tiny things and drawing large and detail-accurate pictures of what he saw. These included insects and other barely visible organisms, including the first examinations of microfossils. In 1665, he popped the cork off a bottle and wanted to see what this spongy kind of wood really looked like up close. So he took a very thin slice of it and examined it under his microscope. And he noticed that the structure was composed of cellula small compartments walled in on all sides, like little dorm rooms. So he called these compartments cells. Of course, uh, the cork was dead wood, so there wasn't anything left to see but the walls of those empty cells. And the first person to see a living cell under a microscope was an acquaintance of Hooke's. Antony van Leeuwenhoek was a Dutch tradesman and craftsman with no formal education, yet he too proved to be an enthusiastic scientist. He was also an expert lens crafter. He made his own microscopes, hundreds of them, and they were better than anything before, with better lighting and sharper images capable of up to 270 times magnification. So he was able to see individual blood cells, nematodes, protozoans, and other tiny organisms that no one ever knew about before. And he called these minute, moving microbes animalcules, like animal molecules, animolecules, animalcules. He was also the first to glimpse the largest domain of life, which had been ever-present everywhere, yet invisible and utterly unknown until that time. Bacteria. Which he discovered in dental scrapings from people who never brushed their teeth. Like a good scientist, Leeuwenhoek documented his observations in precise detail and began a 50-year correspondence with the Royal Society, the first organization ever dedicated exclusively to the advancement of science. His works were published and widely distributed in multiple languages, and he was eventually even elected as a full member of the Royal Society. One thing he did not document was how to make these lenses the way he did. So when he died in 1723... It would be more than a hundred years before anyone figured out how to make microscopes that well again. In 1805, a German philosopher and biologist, Lawrence Oken, used his microscope to conclude that all living beings originate from and consist of vesicles or cells. And this might have been the first expression of cell theory. But the accuracy and the importance of his comment hadn't yet been recognized or confirmed. The next important player was a young Scottish scientist named Robert Brown. Brown was the first to document the internal workings of plant cells around 1833. He was the first to identify the nucleus, and he recognized it as an opaque spot near the middle of all of these cells. And in 1837, Matthias Schleiden, German professor of botany, and Theodore Schwann, Belgian professor of physiology, were sitting together talking about their microscopes. Schleiden recognized that the nucleus was the most important part of plant cells. Schwann noticed similarities between plant cells and certain animal tissues he had seen with his microscope. But animal cells are varied and not as easy to recognize as plant cells, so he didn't realize that that's what they were until Schleiden showed him the most important and diagnostic feature of the cells as they understood it. They went to their microscope and identified the nucleus in what was now confirmed to be animal cells. If plants were made of cells and animals were made of cells, 
And that meant that the cell was the most basic unit of life and that all living things were made of them. They didn't know that protists were neither plant nor animal. Back in their time, everything was animal, mineral, or vegetable. And they thought protozoans were animalcules because they were animate. And they thought that mold, algae, and fungus were like a sort of plant. So if all plants were made of cells with a nucleus, then if animals were made of cells too, they would have to have a nucleus. They didn't yet know that bacteria was something else entirely, and that not every cell had a nucleus. But that doesn't make any difference here, because their assessment is still correct. All life is made of cells, even cells without a nucleus like bacteria and archaea, which wasn't discovered until the 1970s. Having confirmed the fact of the matter, Schleiden and Schwann established the cell theory of biology, and their observations were immediately confirmed by many other scientists who had all been apparently discovering more or less the same thing at about the same time. Now the argument was, where did cells come from? Schleiden thought that cells were just crystallized out of surrounding material, as had been suggested by another scientist years earlier. Then Rudolf Virchow stepped in. Known as the father of modern pathology, this Prussian physician had made a career out of dispelling pseudoscience woo, and he knew that cells didn't pop into existence out of nothing. By then, other doctors had observed gamete cells and witnessed the reproductive process under a microscope. They knew that cells divide into new cells. So in 1858, Rudolf Virchow propounded the third dictum of cell theory that all cells come from other cells. These were the basic tenets of cell theory, so named because the constituent components of cork looked like six-sided compartments. Plant cells have walls. Animal cells don't. Animal cells look more like bubbles or globs of goo. So if animal cells had been discovered first, we wouldn't be talking about cell theory. We'd be talking about bubble theory or the theory of globules. But whatever you call them, all living things are made of them. They're the structural and functional unit of all living things, and they come from pre-existing cells by division.